And we'll start off uh, with uh, Anna Friedrich uh, from Oregon State University, uh, a research fellow there, which would talk to us about uh, um, how we can use the OSM to uh, uh, um, estimate or uh, evaluate uh, sustainable development goals. So please sit down, and I'll give the floor to Anna. Hi, can everybody hear me OK? OK, great. Um, yeah, my name is Hannah Friedrich. I'm a graduate research um, assistant at Oregon State University. And along with uh, my colleagues and co-authors for this talk, uh, Annabelle Schotis, David Rathel, and Jamin Vandenhoek, um, in collaboration with HOT and Development Seed, are working on a project called Missing Millions, which uses satellite imagery, uh, time series analysis um, with machine learning and crowdsource-based methods to characterize informal settlements globally and predict as of yet to be mapped informal settlements um, around the world. And as part of the Missing Millions project, um, we're using OSM data to conduct a assessment of sustainable development goals at informal settlements. Um, so the title of the talk is Development After Displacement, Using OSM Data to Measure SDG Indicators at Informal Settlements. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, which I'm sure is most of you know, of the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals, which were kind of first collated in 2015, um, are critical for monitoring development progress and making policy recommendations uh, leading up to 2030. So a total, there's a total of 17 goals which range from decreasing food insecurity, increasing accessibility to healthcare and education, um, equalizing gender opportunities, uh, as well as extending to making conscious efforts for ecosystem and conservation. Um, these 17 goals have a myriad of indicators and a total of 169 targets, which are kind of been laid out to meet those indicators. And 139 countries have declared their commitment in 2015 to leave no one behind. And oftentimes, that is a really loaded statement. Um, and the people that are most likely to be left behind in these SDG goals are people who have been forcibly displaced from their homes. So this includes refugees, internally displaced people, or IDPs, and asylum seekers. Um, and of this population, there's um, over 70 million people that fall into these categories. So they're often displaced due to armed conflict events, um, gender-based violence, persecution, human rights violations. And not only are they seeking safety and security elsewhere from their homes, but they're also seeking basic services like food, healthcare, immediate needs, um, and opportunities in education and potential jobs. So of the 70 million people that are forcibly displaced, refugees account for 20, uh, about 20 million, or close to 30% of that. And over two thirds of that group are considered to be protracted refugees. So these are people who are leaving their home and going somewhere with the opportunity to return to their host country is really limited. And so oftentimes they'll be in a refugee settlement for at least five years. The average kind of statistic is that a refugee will be in a settlement for 17 years on average. Um, so this is something that's intergenerational um, and kind of speaks to the importance of understanding how we can use SDGs to monitor development at these locations where these populations are and how we can respond to gaps and challenges at those locations. Um, so since 2010, the global forcibly displaced population has increased fourfold, which is a really staggering statistic when you think, break it down to the number of people that are newly displaced per day. So in 2010, that was 10 people, and in 2018, it's almost 40. So this kind of, again, underlines the urgency in kind of addressing new methods of how we can do SDG assessments um, for these populations. And if we look at a map of the refugee populations globally, um, we see that the majority of refugees are in Sub-Saharan Africa or Eastern Africa um, or the MENA regions. So if we look at the top hosting refugee countries, those are Turkey, Pakistan, and Uganda. 
So not only is there a lack of spatial data on locations of informal settlements, which is reliable and open, but we know that refugees and IDPs have been systematically excluded from national census, censuses, representative and household surveys, and global settlement and population data sets. And this is the information that is usually used to kind of track and monitor SDGs at a national level. Um, so there's been notable progress on using satellite-based methods or Earth observation for looking at SDG indicators, but many of the services and amenities like clinics, schools, wash points, you can't track with uh, satellite imagery. Um, there's also a lot of bias and lack of standardization in SDG monitoring at different scales. So we have top-down approaches um, at the national and regional levels that don't always correspond different countries. And there's also locally derived biases that exist. So one co county, for example, may have a certain method of conducting household surveys, which is not conducted in the same manner in a different part of the country. So all of this is kind of speaks to the lack of measured SEG indicators and informal settlements can have huge ramifications for refugee response efforts and future settlement planning. So OSM, this is where OSM comes in. Um, OSM faces a lot of challenges, but also presents a lot of opportunities in SGG reporting and tracking. So um, while OSM data excel at capturing the site-specific features and uh, have nominally global coverage, their use in evaluating SDG indicators has remained, limited, has remained limited. And this is mostly due to inconsistencies in tagging schemes, variabilities in how we assign tags, and kind of lack of communication between data models in uh, reporting SDG targets. But as OSM kind of as a call to this presents an opportunity for creating more standardized data models for SDG mapping across different geographic, regional, and spatial scales. And really the driving, I think, opportunity with OSM is the field-based platform that OSM brings to the table. Much of that is due to the efforts with HOT. Um, so it, it really offers a unique perspective on getting at this really site-specific details that satellite imagery does not provide. So our team at Missing Millions has kind of proposed to do this systematic assessment of OSM, um, with OSM data at informal settlements. So we've created a SDG data model kind of aligned with how OSM data models are created um, based on all possible key value pairs that are included at refugee settlements in Uganda. And for each tag, assigned that to each goal. Um, based on crowd-based indicators and what we know about what each goal is trying to address. And with that kind of data schema, we performed an exploratory spatial analysis of all OSM nodes within UNHCR refugee settlement boundaries in Uganda to understand the temporal and spatial distribution of nodes um, at refugee settlements, the sources of each node, so who's creating these nodes, who's adding them to OSM, uh, as well as a comparison of the counts of these nodes compared to UNHCR settlement fact sheets. Um, and this is kind of means of validation and also kind of illuminating some of the gaps in both data sets. So this is a map of Pajarina refugee settlement in northern Uganda, which has just kind of a sampling of the possible nodes that could exist in OSM. So we have water points, market centers, educational facilities, health facilities, financial services. Um, and this kind of, I think, speaks to what OSM offers that you can't get at with satellite imagery. So this is a screenshot of the OSM data model that we've put together. So for each SDG goal, there's kind of the remote sensing-based indicators. So for poverty, we have WorldPOP, which is a population, global population data set. There's different data sets from CSIN, which is a group at Columbia, which uses a lot of remote sensing-based derived um, data sets for socioeconomic um, goals. 
um, and then the related OSM tags that we've attributed to each goal. So if we specifically look at the inclusive education goal, number four, um, we see that there are cities and infrastructure mapping, there's population data sets that we can get at with remote sensing. Um, as a crowd-based indicator, we can look at school locations, school size, number of teachers, number of bathrooms, um, and then the related OSM tags. In this case, for the amenity key, we have school, kindergarten, college, childcare, and university. And along with that, there's a whole other suite of different data points that get pulled in with that node. Um, and for clean water and sanitation, we kind of have a huge breadth here related to the amenity tags from toilets to waste, water, anything wash related that we can kind of group into that um, clean water and sanitation category. We've tried to be as inclusive as possible with that. So um, in the case of Uganda, there's a lot of data available, um, largely in part to hot Uganda. Um, so we've kind of decided to focus a lot of our preliminary attention on how we can roll out this SDE assessment um, with the refugee settlements in Uganda. Um, and this is a map showing the refugee settlement distribution in Uganda. So if we look at the temporal distribution in node frequency in Uganda, which is when nodes were added to OSM, so not exactly indicates when that node or when that service actually was established on the landscape but when somebody uploaded it to OSM. We see that most of these nodes are being uploaded in May of 2018, which probably speaks to some campaign that was happening at that time in Uganda. Um, but we know that the majority of the settlements were open before 2018. So in 2016, 2017, 2015, um, so this kind of highlights the lag that can result with OSM data in SDG monitoring, um, but we'll kind of, I'll circle back to this at the end um, to mention another field that could be potentially useful. Um, and this is the source of um, tag, or the, um, the sources that each node can have. And this is just the raw data, so I haven't cleaned up or grouped any of these together. But we see that for the nodes that exist at refugee settlements, most of them are unattributable or don't have an attribute. Um, so these are probably nodes that have been added from remote mappers. Um, but we also see Hot Uganda, um, UNHCR, MSF, um, Youth Mappers, Ingrid, <laughs> who I'm not sure if she's here, probably not. But, um, this is showing the distance of the nodes from the settlement boundary and the frequency of them. So kind of the main takeaway with this graph is that the majority of the nodes are unattributed. There's a variety of sources that um, are creating nodes and that the spatial distribution of these nodes from the settlement boundary may kind of illuminate coverage of nodes. So um, we see with the UNHCR, or sorry, with the hot Uganda, um, sources that a lot of the nodes are spanning anywhere from like really close to the border into the settlement itself. Whereas a lot of the UNHCR points are being tagged at places close to the settlement boundary. Um, so without reading too much into it, that kind of could maybe um, suggest that UNHCR is only sampling along the settlement boundary itself and not doing a full complete coverage, um, spatial coverage of possible nodes that could be added to the map. So in order to do kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of known um, OSM nodes, we decided to compare that with UNHCR settlement fact sheets. And these fact sheets exist for every refugee settlement in Uganda and are recorded at least once, either dating to January or June 2018. Um, so in addition to kind of giving a rough estimation of demographic breakdowns at each settlement and having these kind of brief text blurbs on gaps and challenges at each settlement, it also includes the number of motorized boreholes, hand pumps, latrines, pre-primary and primary schools, as well as village health teams. So not all of these data points translate to OSM tags, 
but we can pull out the motorized boreholes, hand pumps, and latrines and do a side-by-side -side comparison of OSM coverage with UNHCR coverage. So in the case of Pajarina, um, this map is showing the OSM nodes for schools, toilets, and hand pumps. Um, and the table shows the kind of side-by-side -side comparison with UNHCR and OSM. So the schools was a one-to-one -one match. Um, if we look at toilets, UNHCR reported 3,777, which are most likely private or household toilets, um, whereas OSM, um, which these nodes were sourced by REACH, um, reported 29 public toilets. And if we look at hand pumps, there was 44 by UNHCR and 34 by OSM. So for this, kind of the biggest takeaway I see is the difference in reporting of private and public toilets between UNHCR and OSM. If we look at Navikali refuse, refugee settlement um, with OSM nodes that were sourced by Hot Uganda, as opposed to REACH, we see uh, thanks, um, differences in schools. Um, again, same kind of pattern with the private versus public toilets. Um, and in the case of motorized boreholes, a uh, slight difference. So despite the differences between OSM and UNHCR, OSM provides additional contextual information that tells perhaps a more complete story of SDG tracking at these locations. So school nodes have information on attendance, lighting, operating hours, staff counts, what kind of um, energy sources are available at these sites, and toilets include information on accessibility, lighting, hand washing. This is kind of the more nuanced story that SDG tracking is trying to attain, um, which we can't always get from these site reports from UNHCR. Um, so in addition to this kind of opportunity with OSM, there's also the start date field, which um, includes the date of operation of many of these features. So we know when the schools were opened, when clinics were opened, um, it, which provides a much more kind of nuanced temporal narrative of these features as opposed to just the time snap of when it was uploaded in OSM. Um, that being said, we have to recognize the limitations in OSM coverage and standardization is really important for improving current SEG monitoring efforts with OSM data. So we know that there's a range of tags that can be attributed to each goal. There's also a range in sources, scales, how it's reported. So a lot, the answer to a lot of these inconsistencies and uncertainties is, at least my takeaway, is improved data models and documentation. So something to think about as we go back to our normal lives after the conferences. Um, and kind of to wrap up here, there's a lot of room for growth and opportunity that we've kind of learned from this preliminary assessment. Um, the main takeaways being that the settlement boundary data is really critical in providing location data, so even where, knowing where to look for SDG um, indicators. Um, secondly, the field-generated OSM data is super critical for offering a more contextual analysis of these SDGs. Um, so our kind of goals with the Missing Millions project is to align with and learn from the hot SDG data model because they have their own ongoing efforts to um, create a data model that incorporates tags that can be attributed to each SDG goal. Um, and there's also this opportunity to conduct field work next year to validate some of these analyses that we've conducted. Uh, so these are my references and uh, thanks for attending. Uh, so thank you, Hannah, for uh, an interesting talk about a very important topic. Uh, there's enough time for uh, questions. Uh, okay, over there. I'm coming. Yeah, thanks very much for a really interesting uh, presentation. I got the feeling we just kind of dipped into the, to the, the shallow surface of what's a very interesting topic. Um, you mentioned exploratory spatial data analysis. 
Um, just broadly speaking, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. What kind of methods you used, what worked? Yeah, so we've, something I'm really interested in is the spatial distribution of nodes within the settlement itself. So how close certain amenities are to the boundary. Um, because the boundary kind of operates as this informal exchange between refugees and host communities, um, by looking at the spatial distribution of certain features may illuminate kind of certain patterns in the socioeconomic conditions within the settlement. Um, so there's kind of been this like exploratory data analysis that's not really driven by certain questions about that, but just seeing what patterns are revealed with that. And just as an aside, um, I don't know if you were, I, I noticed the population is one of the um, Earth observation data sets that you're aware of, and you mentioned the population data set. Um, Facebook recently released 30 meter gridded data globally. Yeah, is this the about. high resolution settlement yeah. layer? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're, yeah, we are using that in some of our analysis. Okay, thank you. Yeah. More questions? Okay, so um, I'll ask you something. Uh, um, I know from, from Israel or, or from the Palestinian territories that um, mapping such, mapping informal areas could be very uh, politically laden. Um, and some populations don't want to be mapped. Uh, do you know of any experiences in those areas where people don't have a stable ground to sit in and may fear that the data would be used against them? And, and Yeah, this is like an internal conversation we've been having and like a question I think the Missing Millions project is really grappling with is um, what are the ethics of sharing this location information on highly vulnerable populations who maybe don't want their location known? Um, so I don't have an easy answer. <laughs> Or simple answer to that. Um, we've kind of thrown around the idea of maybe using field work as a means to gain permission from people to like tell them what we're doing and see if they want to, if their location they want to be included in the final data set that gets shared with people. Um, but yeah, it's really complex. Um, I think kind of like the initial goal is to share the data set with like a very small group of like humanitarian or people who are on the ground who could provide services to this population as opposed to just putting it out in the open like on OSM off the bat. Um, but yeah, that's a lot to think about with that question. So as a follow-up to that question, I'm from Canada, and uh, we went, have gone through the whole process of reconciliation with indigenous population, and they have treaty rights, so uh, it would be very interesting to see how to overlay this in downtown Toronto, uh, treaty rights, and get them to debate, you know, what, what do we do here? And rather than just looking at the SDGs at a global level, and then our, like your point here is it really has no contextual component at that local level. The other thing is the University of Waterloo is looking at how to use uh, AI to search through the local municipal documents, like your fact sheet, for example, and then feed that into a community well-being indicator. So it's 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 a live process rather than you know scraping websites or waiting two years down the road until you analyze a document from a government? Um, so is the question of like how can we have like more real-time monitoring assessments or? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, the model of including people on the ground in data generation is like the first step in that. Um, um, 
for like the comparison part of it? Yeah, we're just looking at the, the fact sheet um, counts, um, which, you know, the validity of which I can't really speak to you, but um, I think there's definitely a lot of limitations in giving a whole settlement kind of snapshot in a two-page PDF, but I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> yeah, next last quest, quick question, please. Hey, Hannah, uh, I was just curious about the, um, the ground truthing um, part of it. Um, as far as what will be the goal of that, um, is it to see um, the validity of one data set over the other or to update with um, the time? Because a year in these settlements is, often has significant amount of change. Um, so are you looking at the um, validity of the groundwork from 2018 to now or the comparison of UNHCR data sets to HOTS data sets, for example? Yeah, I think that's something that's still kind of up in the air in terms of what the main goal is with the field work part of Missing Millions. Um, I'd be really interested to do, like, go to sites that aren't included in OSM or haven't previously been mapped um, on the ground. So like going to IDP sites in Uganda um, and seeing kind of what, why there isn't data at those sites, um, what puts, sets those sites aside from the attention from refugee settlements. Um, yeah, I don't know, in terms of validation, um, it seems like there's a lot of kind of rabbit holes to go down with in terms of, you know, critiquing the temporality of it, but um, I think it's still kind of unknown what the goal, what the field work is. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and now you're, uh, let's give her another round of applause. Yeah. Yeah.